Okay, gang, before we get into chapter 10, we have to talk about this idea of sampling methods and what when you have two samples, are they independent samples or paired samples? And we need to have that discussion before we head into chapter 10 because as you go through the chapter 10 problems, you're gonna see that we have two different groups. And depending on whether or not your samples are independent or paired, we're gonna have different procedures. So if they're independent, if we have two independent samples, we're gonna do a certain type of procedure. If they are two paired samples, we're gonna do a different type of procedure. So you're gonna to have to make this decision, you're gonna to have to make that call pretty early on in the process. So like I said, you're gonna read your problem, you're gonna decide, am I a mean land or proportion land? And now the question that we're gonna going to add next is, are if well, let me back that up. After we decide if we're in mean land or proportion land, ask yourself how many samples you're dealing with or how many treatments you have, something to that effect. And if the answer is two, all right, if we're because we're moving from one now in chapter 10, we're moving to two. So they're all gonna be two in chapter 10. But in general, if the answer is two, then you have to decide are they independent or are they paired? So that's gonna be the next level of questioning we have, right? Not just what land are we in and how many samples do we have, but if the answer to that question, how many samples do we have? If that answer is two, then you're gonna further split that. Are they independent or paired, okay? All right, so dependent samples are paired measurements for one set of items, meaning that for each person or each, I don't know, individual, each object in your sample, if you get two measurements or two numbers from them, you will have dependent samples. Independent samples, are measurements made on two different sets of items, all right? So in paired samples or dependent samples, there's some kind of connection between those measurements that we're getting, and in independent samples, um, the measurements have nothing to do with each other. So again, in paired, there's some connection between the two data sets I'm getting. In independent samples, this data set has nothing to do with that data set. So when you conduct a hypothesis test using two random samples, or potentially even there's two treatments randomly assigned, you must choose the type of test based on whether the samples are dependent or independent. And there are times when instead of dependent, we're gonna just say paired, okay? So if you hear that phrase, if you hear paired, it means dependent, or vice versa. If you hear dependent, it means paired. So it's important for you to know whether your samples are paired or independent. So if the values of one sample affect the values in the other sample, then the samples are paired. If the values in one sample reveal no information about those of the other sample, then the samples are independent. And we had independent formulas back in chapter three. We had two of them. So you could technically use those formulas to try and assess, yes, something's independent or no, it's not. But these are gonna be gut checks and we're gonna see commonalities as we flow through these next few examples. So what we're gonna do for all of these setups is we're gonna identify the variable of interest, all right, because we should start with what is the variable of this problem, right? If it's numerical, we know we're in mean land. If it's categorical, we know we're in proportion land. And then we're gonna determine whether each of the following uh, are independent or paired samples. All right, so let's take a look at our first setup. And as I read through this, we wanna be on the listen for what is the variable in this problem. All right, so let me move this up. And then we will get going. Okay, so here we go. 16 patients suffering from bulimia were randomly divided into two groups. One group received an antidepressant and the other group received a placebo. Number of binges during one week was compared. All right, so first of all, I can hear my variable. I hear it's number of binges, okay? So number of binges during one week. All right, so let me go ahead and write my variable down. And I also want to take note that I have two groups here. I have the group that received 
the treatment, the antidepressant treatment, and the group that received the placebo. So I do want to just point out, because this will come up later in chapter 10, that these were two treatments that were assigned, right? And I'm going to assume randomly assigned because it says randomly in here. So two treatments randomly assigned. So you can imagine I have 16 patients, right? And I split them into two groups of eight. And then I want us to think that I'm gonna ask each of the eight patients in the treatment group and each of the eight patients in the placebo group, how many times did you binge this week? Do you think the number of binges that the treatment group tells me has anything to do with the number of binges that the placebo group tells me? Do I think one influences the other or vice versa? And the answer is no. Right? I don't know what the treatment group is going to say, but that's going to have no effect on what the, the placebo group says. I mean, pending I blinded the, the, the study, um, excuse me, the experiment, so that they didn't know if they were receiving the treatment or the placebo. But this would be an example of two independent groups. I randomly assigned these, or I randomly assigned treatments and broke these patients into two groups, and those two groups have nothing to do with one another. So this would be a, an example of independent samples. Right, so these are independent. And again, the reason being that the number of binges from patients in the antidepressant group should have no bearing on the number of binges of patients from the placebo group. So those two groups are completely unrelated. Okay? All right, let's take a look at B. And again, let's be on the listen for what is the variable in this problem. So a video to increase driver's awareness of accident prevention is to be tested. 100 16-year-old males are available for the study. 50 are randomly selected to view the video. Number of accidents for the two groups are compared during the six-month periods following viewing of the video by the 50 males. Okay. So I want to be clear on, on something. It says 116-year-old males. This doesn't mean that people were 116 years old. They were actually 16 years old, and there were 100 of them. So I had a sample size of 100. I had 50 watch a video, 50 did not watch a video. So again, you can hear that these two treatments are randomly assigned. So I have my two groups, right? But I'm going to just take note here, two treatments randomly assigned. Now there's a hundred teenagers here and what am I keeping track of? What am I going to ask each of them at the end of this six months? I'm going to ask them about the number of accidents they got into. All right, so I can see it right here. I got another numerical variable. All right, so number of accidents and it would be during this six month period. Okay, and then let's try and think about, do the number of accidents from the teenagers who watched the video, does that number, does that data have anything to do with the number of accidents from the teenagers who did not watch the video? And, and the answer is no. The, the folks that are the teenagers that watch the video, they're not going to get into more or less, or I should say more or fewer accidents because they watch, or what I'm, I'm not even using my words what, right. What I'm trying to say is the number of accidents that the, that the teenagers who watched the video, the number of accidents they got into has no bearing on the number of accidents that the, the teenagers who didn't watch the video got into. So these are independent samples again. And what I was sort of trying to say before I flubbed my words is, let's say the video worked and, and these 50 males got into fewer accidents. Just because they're getting into fewer accidents doesn't have any effect on what the, the, the kids over in the non-video group were doing. So again, independent samples. The number of accidents from teenagers who watched the video should have no bearing on the number of accidents from the teenagers who did not watch the video. Okay, so let's... 
move these up so we can see C and D. And again, we're going to be on the list for what is the variable in this problem. All right, so 36 people participated in an experiment to determine whether a certain herb lowers blood pressure. The systolic blood pressure was measured initially and then 90 minutes after ingesting the herb. All right, so if I take a step back, right, it looks like I've got 36 people. I'm gonna give them some herb and I'm gonna see if it lowers their blood pressure, right? And they're gonna measure my blood pressure before I take the herb and after I take the herb. So I wanna be really careful with my variable here. My variable isn't just my blood pressure. What I'm really interested in is the change in my blood pressure, right? Because I'm trying to figure out if it lowers my blood pressure. So they're gonna take two measurements from me and then they're gonna subtract that number to see if my blood pressure was any lower. So they're actually in interested in the difference in systolic blood pressure here. So I'm gonna put, this is the difference in systolic blood pressure. And whenever I look at differences, I usually go after minus before. You don't have to, but I just, I want you to hear that option. Um, and in this case, if I was the maker of the herb, I would hope this difference would be negative because if this difference was negative, then your blood pressure afterwards was lower than your blood pressure before. That's how I would get a negative number if this number was larger. So it would be, um, it would be indicating that the herb might be working. All right. So. I'm gonna get this data set from your initial blood pressures, and then I should say your initial blood pressures and then your blood pressure after the herb. So you can hear, I have from one person, I'm gonna get two measurements. And do I think those measurements are connected? Do I think your blood pressure before the herb has any connection to your blood pressure after the herb? And the answer is absolutely, right? So I want us to also hear that I have one patient giving two measurements. All right, so one patient gives two measurements. Whenever you have this kind of setup, you're going to have paired samples. All right, it's entirely possible that even if the herb works, that somebody with high blood pressure before they take the herb, we'll still have higher blood pressure after. Even if it lowered, I think the high numbers might match with the high numbers, or vice versa, the low numbers might match with the low numbers. But those before and afters are absolutely connected because they're connected by the same person, because one patient is giving two measurements. So in this example, we have paired samples. Blood pressure before taking the herb will definitely have an effect on blood pressure after taking the herb. All right, last one on this page. So a company has many plants throughout the world that produce the same product. A company official feels that rearranging the assembly line will increase output. He selects five plants and records their output for the month, excuse me, for one month. He then rearranged the assembly lines and it again records output for one month. So if I take a look at this, I have five plants, and I don't know what they're producing. It doesn't really matter. I'll use that general term. They're producing widgets. So they're going to produce some widgets, and I'm going to record their output during the month. And output might be the number of widgets. Maybe if this was Apple, it's the number of iPhones. I, I don't know what it is, and it doesn't matter. They're not, I'm not trying to be specific here. So I have five plants. I'm going to record their output for one month on this one version of the assembly line. Then I'm gonna record their output again on this different assembly line. So I want you to hear that one plant will give us two measurements. Right? And this company official is actually interested in which assembly line is more efficient. So he's gonna compare these outputs and see if there's a difference between them. So the variable here is actually the difference in monthly output.
Now, it doesn't matter which assembly line you use first. I'm gonna go, just cause like I said, I like to do after minus before. So I'm gonna do the ladder assembly line. I'm gonna run out of room. I'll put it here, minus the former assembly line. All right, and I'm gonna hope that this number, if, if I'm the company official, maybe I hope this number is positive so that you're producing more on this newer assembly line, like I've made it more efficient. All right, and you're starting to see me say difference and difference, and, and that's always gonna be the case. When you have paired samples, we're gonna be looking at the difference between your two data sets. All right, and again, we're at this situation where one plant gave me two measurements, right? Just like one patient gave me two measurements. So we're taking two measurements from each plant um, and the monthly product output for the first assembly line will definitely be connected to the monthly output or monthly product output, I should say, of the second assembly line. Again, it's entirely possible that uh, of these five plants, maybe one of them's like a superstar plant, right? They're like, man, we can put anything together on an assembly line. And they'll have higher numbers on the former assembly line and on the latter assembly line. So high numbers are very likely connected to high numbers. Low numbers are connected to low numbers. Like if we have a plant that's just really inefficient, they're probably really inefficient on both assembly lines. Even if the new assembly line makes them more efficient, they might still just suck overall. So since those two number or two data sets, the data set we get from the first assembly line and then the second one, they're definitely connected. Since they're connected, we're gonna have paired samples. So what I would recommend for you is go to the next page, try E, F, G, H, and I on your own, and then come back to the second part of this video. So just push pause right now, come back to it and see if you got those answers right. All right, good luck, I'll see you in a bit, bye. Okay, let's take a look at these next few setups. So a construction engineer wants to compare the time it takes technicians to replace the glass in two different brands of windows, brand A and brand B. Four technicians are randomly selected to replace the glass for windows of brand A. Four additional technicians are randomly selected to replace the glass windows for brand B. The time for each replacement is recorded. So first of all, I can hear that time these times for um, replacing windows is what we're gonna record. All right, so I've got time as my variable. Let me write that down. And let's just see how many folks I have in here. So it looks like I have my two different groups, right? I have the four technicians that are doing brand A windows, and then I have four different technicians doing brand B windows. So again, it looks like we have, in a sense, treatments randomly assigned, not necessarily, yeah, actually it did say randomly selected. Um, so I have eight technicians, right? they're each giving me one data value. And I'm, I'm writing it up this way just to kind of compare and contrast with what we were doing previously, right? I'm gonna get one data value from each person. All right, this is different than when they were paired. So in parts C and D, for each person in our experiment, we were getting two numbers from them. I want you to hear that I'm just getting one from each of these technicians. That's a different way to identify that these are independent samples. So the amount of time it takes these four technicians to replace brand A is going to have nothing to do with the amount of time it takes these different four technicians to replace windows of brand B. These just, they have nothing to do with each other. Maybe brand A is better and these four times will be smaller. Uh, maybe brand B is better. It doesn't, I don't know, I'd have to actually run the experiment, but these four technicians and their output 
are gonna have no bearing on these four technicians and their output. So we have independent samples. All right, a construction engineer wants to compare the time it takes technicians to replace glass in two different brands of windows, brand A and brand B. Four technicians replace the glass in both brands of windows. The time for each replacement is recorded. So we think you can hear the differences in how E and F are being set up. Here I had eight technicians total, and each one was giving me a data point value. Now I think you can hear I have four technicians, and they're each giving me two data values. Right, so each technician is giving me two data values. The variable is still this time it takes to replace windows. But now I think you can hear that they're paired. Ooh, and actually, I made my own mistake. Let me back this up, guys. This is the difference in time taken to replace windows. Just wanted to make an error intentionally so you could see what was going on. All right, so this is the difference in time taken to replace windows. All right, and I can, it doesn't matter what order you go in, I'll just say I'll take brand A and I'll subtract the times from brand B. And you could have gone brand B minus brand A, it doesn't really matter. Um, but yes, these are paired samples. And the reason I caught myself, anytime you have paired samples, we're gonna be looking at the difference in data. All right, so the time it takes a technician replacing a brand A window will be connected to the time it takes that same technician replacing a brand B window. Because it's possible that one of these, well, and not even it's possible, one of these technicians is the best in the out of the four, and they're probably gonna replace both brand A and brand B faster than the other technicians, which is fine. That's why we just need to take a look at the difference between the two times for each technician. And we're gonna look at the difference in all those replacement times and compare those numbers or work some hypothesis tests off of the difference data. And that's always the process in paired samples. All right, so whenever we're gonna have paired samples, once you recognize it, you know you're gonna subtract some stuff. You're gonna look at the difference. That's why when I say subtract, that's where that's coming from. Difference in the two data sets. Okay, so let's, let's move along here. We're gonna move, let me move this up. And I think I got that in view now. Okay, so now we have 12 locations were randomly selected to measure sulfate levels prior to installation of the new pollution control equipment. And 12 locations were randomly selected to measure sulfate levels after installation of pollution control equipment were examined. Okay. So let's take a look at what's going on here. What was the variable? It's a little, little funky. It's not very specific. It just says that they're gonna measure sulfate levels. All right, and it looks like I have 12 locations where I selected for the, the, the four, right? And then 12 locations were selected after. So it looks like I have two different sets of locations. I have 12 on the before, 12 on the after. And that's probably, I mean, if we think about it, it's probably a, a, a silly way to do it. I, if I was running this experiment, I'd wanna do the same location before and after, but it looks like they have 12 locations um, before and a different 12 locations after, and they're measuring sulfate levels. Okay, so I'm gonna put here, I can see sulfate levels, whatever that is. They're gonna measure them before at 12 locations and then after at a different 12 locations. So my variable here is sulfate levels. And if we're kind of continuing on this, right, I have 24 locations, right, 12 before, 12 after, each giving one data value.
And again, I'm not saying this is the best way to run this experiment, but I, this is how it was written. So I can, I can handle that. And the, the before the 12 sulfate levels, ooh, the 12 sulfate levels prior to installation from those initial locations have nothing to do with the 12 sulfate levels after this installation. They're completely separate. So these are going to be independent samples. I have no reason to believe one set of locations high sulfate levels have any bearing on the next set of locations high sulfate levels. They're unconnected because there are 12 different locations. All right, so let's read part H. 12 locations around a factory were select selected at random. At each location, measurements of sulfate levels prior to installation of new pollution control equipment and measurements of sulfate levels after installation of pollution control equipment were compared. So now you see the difference, right? They're saying at each location, each of these 12, we're gonna go before and after. And when you see that set up, that is the paired version, right? So we're gonna say, all right, our variable, it's not just gonna be different, I'm sorry, it's not gonna just be sulfate levels, it's gonna be the difference in sulfate levels, right? So this, now that they're paired, is the difference in sulfate levels. And again, I would go after minus before. And I would hope this difference was negative because I would hope I wasn't as polluted after I put in that pollution control equipment. Um, but again, so this time I had 12 locations, right? And these 12 locations were each giving two data values, a before and an after. So this is paired samples. All right, last but not least, let's see if we can figure out what's going on for the setup in part G. We have the number of years required for graduation of 13 randomly selected engineering students at University A are compared with the number of years required for graduation of 13 randomly selected engineering students at University B. All right, so let's, the first thing I can see is I've got a variable. Somehow I'm talking about number of years, okay? So I can hear that phrase popping up. And before I decide if I just wanna write number of years or difference in number of years, let me figure out if these are independent or paired. All right, so as I go through this, it looks like I have 13 students from University A and a different 13 students from University B. So I have 26 students and they are each giving me one data value. All right, and the 13 students at University A, however long it takes them to graduate should have no effect on what's going on with University B. Those are two separate schools. So these are independent samples. So we don't need the word difference here. The variable is just straight up number of years. Okay. So as we progress through chapter 10, you're gonna come across, well, every problem in chapter 10 will have two groups. All right, they might be before and after. Anytime you have a before and after like this, it's pretty common pairings. Um, but you'll have these two groups and you will have to make the, the judgment call. Are these independent or are they paired? Because we have a process for independence and we have a process for paired. And this distinction will only happen in mean land. We, we don't have to worry about it in proportion land. We're only gonna do independent samples in proportion land. But all of these variables in this little worksheet, they were all numerical. We would ultimately always be in mean land. So we will have to decide independent or paired. We have a process for independent. We have a process for paired. And we're going to get to that uh, in just a little bit. We're about to start chapter 10. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Bye.